Hello and welcome to News Click. You are watching Present, Past and the Future. It is paradoxical that although Hindu nationalists deify the nation in its feminine form, love for it, that is nationalism, must be robust, muscular and masculine. In the 70 years since India and Pakistan agreed to cease fire after hostilities for 15 months, much of the Hindutva narrative within the country has centered around demonizing Jawaharlal Nehru. He has been accused of being too soft and accommodative of Islamabad's designs, especially on Kashmir. Nehru is accused of not having the courage to drive back invaders who swamped Jammu and Kashmir in October 1947. He is also held guilty of internationalizing the issue by taking the matter into United Nations on the 1st of January 1948. This so-called image of Nehru being a weakling is juxtaposed with the decisiveness of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. It is emphasized that he has propagated a version of nationalism which is muscular and thereby manly. It fits with the publicized image of Modi as the alpha male with a 56 inches chest size. History, however, cannot be oversimplified and framed in black and white terms. Actions of leaders holding crucial offices during watershed moments in the past must be contextualized within the time they lived in and acted. There is no point in theorizing how Modi would have acted if he had been the Prime Minister in 1949 or 48 for that matter. The way out of this hazy view of the past is to get more facts. Information of what precisely happened, who said what and recommended what. Much of this information in most countries including India lie buried and locked in government vaults. Many of these documents and personal papers are time barred. But even if it is time to make public such documents, government and linked institutions often <coughs> prevent truth from becoming public knowledge. The state has been known to use its discretionary powers to prevent release of information because it could damage their political interest. A recent such instance has come to light. A researcher wished to get into the heart of accusations against Nehru regarding Kashmir that he did not act firmly. It is not that he held a brief for India's first Prime Minister or any other party. His interest was in unearthing or finding out more information of what transpired in history in the public domain. I am joined by Venkatesh Nayak, who has consistently researched the turbulent history of Kashmir in the period following its accession to India. He works with the Commonwealth in, uh, Human Rights Initiative. Uh, welcome to the program, Thank Venkatesh. You. Thank you. Let me not say I decided not to tell the story of your mm -hmm. right to inf information application from my side. Okay. I wanted to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. In a nutshell, your RTI application, what you sought and what you were given and what you were denied. Okay. Uh, if you'll just permit me a little bit of a background as to sure. why I you know, filed this RTI. Yes. Your viewers might be interested. Why is it that uh, this gentleman is looking for 70 euros? Yeah, and and RTI activist Obviously. that was somebody with Obviously. a human Obviously. interest in Kashmir. Absolutely right. You see, I work for the promotion and use of the right to information in Kashmir ever since uh, I've been working there since 2004. Right. Um, we have trained citizens who are part of organizations in the civil society sector, journalists, students, and private citizens mm -hmm. in the use of right to information. And they've used it to fantastic right. uh, you know, impact. Now, during one such interaction in Jammu and Kashmir, um, I was asked mm. whether it would be possible to get a copy of the instrument of accession that Jammu and Kashmir 
the princely state at that point of time in 47 signed with the dominion of India hmm. because that document is a disputed document. Right. In fact, the very existence of the document has been has called been into question, question by not only Indian scholars but also foreign uh, you know, uh, academics, right. notably uh, uh, people like uh, the late professor Alastair Lamb. So, I took that up as a challenge and filed an RTI with the National Archives, hoping that that is where. And then uh, you finally managed uh, sorry, to get no, it. No, no, no. Uh, I'm sorry, I must correct myself. I filed it with the Ministry of Home Affairs because the uh, Jammu and Kashmir uh, Department is part of the Ministry of Home Affairs. And then eventually hoping. you got it in the Eventually National I got Archives. it from there. And then that sort of got me interested in the further, dates on which. Further yes. examining this yes. particular yes. part of the yes. Indian history. Because in addition to the existence of the document, there is also uh, doubt about the actual dates on which the accession instrument was signed and accepted. Right. Now that is also part of the research that is going on. As part of that research, I found out that the Teen Murthy Library, you know, which is also known as the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library based in Delhi, which mm -hmm. off late is in, the con is in a big controversy in terms of the membership of the executive board of that. The character also. Exactly, that is going to change uh, very soon and people are going to be ejected Has already out. in fact. Yes, it, the people have been ejected out unfortunately. Um, so that is where I found out that there are certain papers mm -hmm. uh, which have been microfilmed from the collection of Lord Mountbatten, the last Viceroy and the first Governor General of Independent India. And while going through that, I came across uh, references to a whole range of documents. One of them was uh, a, an interview that was done with uh, Sir Roy Buker, who mm. was the second Commander-in-Chief of the Indian Army after independence. This mm. was just before, a, re, a year before um, uh, General... Uh, and this interview Kariyapa of Roy yes. Buker was done by B.R. Nanda. This was done by B.R. Nanda, the biographer. The, the, noted, the biographer. noted academic yes, and biographer. Yes. yes. And um, When I, was this interview conducted? This was done sometime idea? in the late 60s or early 70s. Okay. Uh, the document actually is a typed up transcript of the interview. There are about right. uh, 25 to 30 pages of that, unfortunately. And you managed to see only... Uh, uh, I saw the whole document. You saw the whole. But I could only get, um, uh, you know, about three pages out because there is a... Um, now, out of the, th the three pages which you could get out, yes. uh, the most important point is that I think you have also written about yes. it, is that Nehru actually wanted to take military action Absolutely. against uh, what yes. we now call yes. POK to try yes. to get it back. Absolutely right. In fact, it's a, it's a longish interview. It's, it's a sort of a freewheeling interview about uh, what uh, Sir Roy Buker remembered about his time spent in India and there are lots of interesting vignettes. Mm -hmm. Part of that is his uh, conscious recall of what happened during the 1947, 48 up to 49 period. Mm. And there, there, is, there, in a couple of places, he refers to a file that he had handed over mm. before he, uh, or just around the time when he retired in January 1949 for uh, safekeeping at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. I'll tell you just something which I okay. read from some other source okay. regarding his retirement in January 1949. Uh, yes. yeah, but please yes. continue. So, uh, that uh, set of papers uh, were also mentioned in the index hmm. of uh, transcripts maintained by the Nehru Memorial Library. And next to that uh, entry in the catalog, in that hmm. index, it said closed. Now, mm. I was not too sure as to why archival papers should be closed for public scrutiny. Right. Now, this is without uh, having applied under RTI. This is generally you, you take a membership. When, when yes. you applied... Yeah, you take a membership of Nehru Memorial Library, you ac get access to the uh, books that are there in the library and you also and the get microfilms. access to the holdings. Yes. Yeah. The microfilms, the typed up answers, uh, sorry, transcripts of interviews, papers, Nehru's uh, you know, copies of his correspondence. True. They are all lying there. So, ordinarily, one should be able to access them with, of course, you know, completing necessary permissions. They have this curious you know, uh, procedure where you take the director's permission for papers prior to 1947 and you take the chairperson's uh, permission for accessing papers after 1947, this Government of India papers. So, this was part of that. So, I went through that whole process, got access to the interview um, of Sir Roy Buker. And there I found out that he had given a file. I looked up that file. It said it is closed. And then I made inquiries with the senior officers in the <coughs> Nehru Memorial Library. And they said there are two grounds on which certain kinds of papers are closed. Now these, these are closed under the instructions of the Ministry of External yes. Affairs. So there are two, you know, two reasons. Correct. One is if a government agency says they must be closed yeah. or if the donor of the papers right. say they must be closed. But here in this case the government says so. Here we didn't know. Okay. The catalog merely said closed. Okay. Do that's you know now? Now we know. That's the reason why I filed RTI. Right. I said, A, tell me uh, which are all the papers that are available in your holdings that are closed from public scrutiny. Then I specifically asked, 
those given by the central government, those given now, by the state the, government. Without getting caught in the technicalities, ha. you know, what your paper revealed, what you were able to see. Yes. That says that includes uh, that a transcript of that interview with uh, B. R. Nanda. Yes. It also, uh, yes, yes. does it also include some personal papers of uh, Bucher or is this? No, this no, is, it is just is a purely typed out transcript of the interview. And this is Bucher's version of Bucher's the interview. Bucher's version. Uh, no, 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 this is Nanda's version of this the interview. This is Nanda, Nanda's, Nanda's version, version of, of the, the interview, what he has typed out. And there, there is a reference to that Kashmir file. So I said, I want to look right. at that. What, what Bucher may have said somewhere else is not there in... Uh, no, no, this is, is exclusively not. the contents of his interview. So they are, they are part of the closed uh, papers, which which we have not, no one yes, has Yes, yes, whatever he, he has given as official so, documents uh, are closed. Venkatesh, I want yes. to just share something with you, which mm -hmm. I learned. You First thing is that you referred to hmm. the retirement of uh, General Bucher yes. in January 1949. Yes. Uh, very peculiarly... Uh, I, while uh, dis after deciding that I am going to be uh, talking to you on this very important matter of public interest, I was doing my own reading and I stumbled on a blog written by Mr. Lal Krishna Advani mm -hmm. in 2013, where he also talks that he uh, he has also been pursuing uh, what General Bucher may have written at various places, and he says that he came across a website. There is no mention as to which particular website it is that he came across a website where Ms. General Bucher's uh, statements and his views are uh, available on various matters related to the history of Kashmir at that point. Now, the first thing is that we do not know whether what Mr. Advani is writing is correct or not, but nonetheless, what he says is very significant because most of the observations which Mr. Advani presents as a correct observation requiring further study end up exonerating uh, Nehru from the charges that have been leveled against him by the same organization and the party which Mr. Advani has been part of right from the time when he was a youngster. Now, he says very interestingly is that uh, General Bucher advised Nehru that militarily it is not possible to establish control and I am quoting parts of it entire Jammu and Kashmir because the British are supporting Pakistan. Bucher also says that Nehru wanted an Indian commander-in-chief, which was Bucher himself, in the middle of 1948, about six, seven, eight months before Bucher actually retired and uh, General Kariappa became the first Indian uh, commander-in-chief. But Bucher said, told uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nehru <coughs> that this is not possible. L let me just make a slight okay. mention that this is also a time when peculiarly the Pakistani counterpart is also British. Yes. General Douglas uh, sure. Gracie. Yes, Gracie. So he is, he is on the other yes. side. One of the arguments which uh, General Bucher makes in his uh, you know, conversations with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, Nehru is that uh, it is going to be very problematic because uh, British uh, are there on both sides. Yes. So we can't up, can't end up fighting one another. You know, if, uh, here is the C CNC here, and on the other side is also a, a British CNC. Then Bucher also told Nehru that the British did not want an Indo-Pak war, and that he says that we feared that there would be hostilities, that it would break out. Thereby, we issued secret orders to all British officers to stand down in the event of war. He is very emphatic in his assertion that British did not want India to get the whole of Jammu and Kashmir because then Pakistan would feel very threatened and would eventually get overrun, which the British did not want. Now, the widespread feeling in London, this is again a direct quote, was that if India was in control of areas contiguous to Pakistan, the latter would not survive. Top secret cables exchanged between British missions in India, Pakistan and Whitehall tell the true story. He also says that the CNC was receiving instructions from the British High Commission in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. Now tell me that if this be the case, where was Nehru at fault and why this campaign against him? Well, um, I think again, like you quite rightly said in the beginning, I hold no brief for any individual yes. and that would apply to Mr. Advani as so, well. But at the same time, I have not seen the source of information that he's making a mention. Ideally, it would have been uh, 
proper moment will believe that mr advani let, 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 let us leave it let us leave it at that because yeah. it's not it's pointless to comment on something that one hasn't read or seen but the interview that mr nanda had with sir roy buker hmm. portrays uh, a very resolute nehru but uh, in words that certainly do him a lot of uh, give him a lot of credit uh, first of all in those extracts of the interview which i have actually made public on our organization's website sir roy buker is uh, uh, reported to have said that he was amazed at the fantastic grasp of military issues that pandit nehru hmm. had at that point of time particularly in kashmir that's number 1 hmm. and number 2 the extract also mentions that he's got two letters from pandit nehru about the possibility of taking the battle to into pakistan right and he says he uh, sir roy buker says <coughs> he can't quite remember whether those letters are lying with him at home or they are in the file which he right. has handed over to nehru memorial library but he said he will check up and if they are not there in the library then he will give copies of those letters hmm. and he says that it was indicated to him at that point of time that nehru was contemplating that if the un mission on pakistan on jammu and kashmir had failed hmm. or had not given any um, sensible solution for cessation of hostilities then he said that the indian army would have to be prepared to invade pakistan mm. to enter into pakistan go into pakistan those are the words that are used mm. so it is not as if nehru was somebody who was completely foreclosed to all all options because of the panchshila or the peace peaceful coexistence uh, philosophy that he later on uh, Uh, you know oh, pursued came uh, several years uh, later several years later so you talk about 48 49 exactly, exactly i mean less than a decade he is okay. in the middle of mid 1950s that 1955, is the time the bandung conference so, yeah, and all of that in 1955 exactly so as a leader as a statesman and as somebody not simply because of the fact that he hailed from kashmir but because of the strategic importance of that region to newly independent i think there's another thing which yes. is very clear that you know what we read yeah. about yeah. the papers which uh, mr advani quoted yes. you know it appears that he also quotes an interview lengthy interview mm -hmm. given by uh, uh, gen, uh, you mm -hmm. know general sam manik shah yes to an indian journalist you know former editor of mine prem shankar jha yes where uh, from those accounts is also clear that uh, as far as kashmir is concerned there really was not much of a difference of opinion between nehru and sardar patel mm -hmm. uh one was a more mild mannered person nehru yes, yes. sardar patel was much more emphatic about saying everything on which both of them may have had the same position yes. that's the only thing which comes across yes. there is also a very interesting point which comes across in what uh buker is reported to have said from the website which uh, abdul sadwani quoted is that nehru had decided to strike at the basis of the raiders in pakistan but lord mountbatten opposed this so which means that the entire story which has been created yes. that it was nehru the weakling and yes. you know uh, who uh, just did not uh, do anything and he allowed pakistan to walk away with so many kilometers of our land yes. and then ended up internationalizing the issue and creating problems for india which cannot be which can only be solved by a very robust and a masculine prime minister yes. representing a hindu yes. nationalist school of thought in fact this comes out in another part of the interview of sir roy buker with uh, b r nanda where he says that nehru was extremely concerned by the fact that there was cross border shelling happening in the akhnur and nearby sectors right, right, and that exactly. shelling couldn't necessarily happen through invaders right. who were simply armed with small arms right. it would have to come from yeah, those were invaders they had tribal invaders would not exactly, be getting that kind exactly, of heavy uh, exactly. artillery man power so a response to that would necessarily have invo uh, have involved the option of military action into pakistan right and of course good sense prevailed uh, we may today uh, wonder whether so, it was good sense at all or not i mean there are different views on that but the question is um, sir roy buker says that he was not privy to how the decision making process in the indian cabinet happened so so at that so, point of time so basically as we get towards the you know concluding part of our discussion yes i think there is a very strong case that uh, not just your rti application but yes. whatever material yes. is there especially on this very important chapter yes. of indian politics yes. should be made available so Absolutely. that everything is there in the Absolutely. public domain Absolutely. and then we can know whose narrative is yes. correct whether the demonization of nehru is correct or or it is not yes in fact that would again it, it all that is being mentioned is a set of papers that are part of one file now i wouldn't really say that the entire mystery would be clarified by that but the fact is the fact of the matter is this nehru memorial library is a public authority under the right to information right. act it is sitting on a set of papers that have been closed and which must be made public for more than 70 years yes. it 
is the, the issue is this the RTI Act says that in certain circumstances information can be withheld from public disclosure but right. there must be a justification there is no justification that justification must still be based on the RTI Act so the only, justifi only justification at this stage is yes. that if we do not release this paper yes. we can continue a false narrative on Nehru and help our uh, present political uh, yeah, quite possibly uh, quite possibly and in fact when the government has taken the steps to make a lot of information about Nitaji Subhashchandra Bose's disappearance public there is well, no there reason still, why there are still yes. some documents there are still some documents yes public. The PM was still sitting on a whole lot of documents. Uh, I think it's high time that the government actually reviewed not only the Kashmir papers, but practically all the papers that are in the Nehru Memorial Museums and libraries. Not just anything, anything which is Look related everything. to the national movement. Absolutely. And anything that con constitutes affairs of the government of India. Exactly. That must be in the public domain. I think that's well said. Thank Absolutely. you very much for coming and joining me on this discussion. Yes. History you. has been a <coughs> crucial weapon for Hindu nationalists in their rise to power. The history of India has been depicted as a period when Muslim rulers subjugated Hindus and the country. It has followed from this argument that Hindus must correct this wrong and this can be done by enlisting behind Hindutva forces. While medieval history is all about interpretation, modern history has gaps which can be filled by more information. Effort to prevent this must be opposed. The labors of historians and researchers to bring out more information in the public domain must be supported and disseminated. Thank you for watching this episode and please do share with friends, family and colleagues.